Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here and to talk about CAPS. These are my financial disclosures. This is the outline of my talk. Let me tell you first how I got involved in the, in the disease of auto-inflammatory disease and how I got involved with CAPS. It all started with this 14-year-old girl who was admitted to our hospital with suspected diagnosis of rheumatic fever. She had recurrent episodes of arthritis and fever. But when we took a thorough history, we suddenly found out that for years she had episodes with fever, arthralgia, the rash, similar to this at the picture, conjunctivitis, and what was really their major complaint was severe fatigue. At the end of my consultation, I apologized to the mother and the sister who were sitting next to her at her bed because I always was screaming and shouting at them. It was very noisy in the room and they had a hard time to understand what I was saying. And suddenly the mother and the sister, they started to laugh and telling me, you know, we are used to this. In our family, there are many who have hearing problems and when we have our family party, it's always very noisy. At this point, we thought maybe that would be really interesting to get to know this family more. And we asked them if they could invite us to the next family meeting, what they did. And this is the result of it. We were able to interview 42 family members, and interestingly, 13 family members were symptomatic with CAP-specific symptoms. And they allowed us to draw blood and the clinical suspicious diagnosis of Markel-Wells and CAPS was confirmed by, at this point, new mutation in the NLRP3 gene. It was an E311K mutation. As you know, CAPS is caused by a heterozygous germline or a somatic gain of function mutation in the NLRP3 gene. CAPS can be sporadic or autosomal dominant inherited. The encoded protein NLRP3 is expressed on several cells. And up to date, today are more than 90 confirmed diagnoses reported in the InFever database, and more than 90% are located in exon 3, like our mutation of the family. It is interesting, there is a very good genotype and phenotype correlation. However, in NOMID and less in the others, in NOMID there are 50% of patients where no germline mutation is found. And in these so-called mutation negative ones, in 70% of somatic mosaicism is detected. This was also the case in the study of the adult onset of CAPS patient. To identify this somatic mutation, it might require subcloning and or deep sequencing. So this gain-of-function mutation in the NLRP3 gene leads to an increased inflammasome activation and through several steps, finally, to conversion of the pre-IL-1 beta to IL-1 beta and then to an excessive release of IL-1 beta. This pro-inflammatory cytokine has effects on different organ and organ system, which is depicted here on this slide. It causes fever, but it also causes increased pro-inflammatory cytokine release and also acute phase reactions. All the things we find in CAPS patients, but also other auto-inflammatory diseases. Making the diagnosis in CAPS can really be challenging. In the past, like in our family, the whole family members were seen in different university clinics. The diagnosis was missed, so they were underdiagnosed. Now, with the opportunity of molecular genetic testing, there might be the risk of overdiagnosing them. Not everyone who is carrying a variant has an autoinflammatory disease. In the past, also many of these patients were undertreated because they didn't have a diagnosis and no treated, uh, treatment was available. So with the availability of IL-1 inhibitors, there might be the risk of overtreating them. So before treating a patient, it's important really to establish a reliable diagnosis. And therefore, the diagnostic criteria for CAPS have been developed, and as just Marker said, also just recently, the classification criteria. 
both have in common, you need to have evidence of elevated acute phase reaction plus the characteristic flares and the characteristic phenotype at least for six months after excluding other causes. So if you have a variant, you're not sure about the pathogenicity, this is what Marco already said, you can look it up in the InFevers database and there you can see the phenotype for this variant but also the ACMC classification, which shows you if it's a clear pathogenetic variant or is it likely one of, one of the uncertain significance. And this list is our, shows you the classification criteria. And for CUPS, it means if you have a clear pathogenetic variant, only one of the key symptoms like urticaria-like rash, the eye manifestation or sensory hearing loss is needed. If you have a variant of uncertain significance, you need at least two. And if you have no molecular variant, you need the whole phenotype. So the question is now, how do we pick up these key symptoms and how do we assess disease activity in these patients? So in clinic, these five columns help us. First of all, the history, the family history, then the patient assessment using the IDI the physical assessment, the inflammatory markers, and then the organ-specific examinations. And this is the example of the IDA. This is the diary which our patients are asked to fill in if they are symptomatic, and this is uh, the, the diary for one month. Measuring inflammatory markers are mandatory during a flare, but also in remission. So in addition to the complete blood count and the SAE and the CRP level, we found in our cohort that the S100 proteins are a valuable tool for diagnosis and also for monitoring. And then according to the clinical findings, you can go for imaging or organ-specific diagnostic, like if you have skeletal deformities, you would do an X-ray or an MRI, which shows you the bony lesions. If you're in doubt, you could do a skin biopsy and you find the neutrophilic infiltrates. Ocular exam can show you uveitis or like here, papilla edema. And it is very important, and in all patients where you are suspicious that they have caps, that you do an audiogram and that you have to do the high-frequency audiogram. That means the high frequency up here because here are the early changes. If you have signs and symptoms for a CNS, you should do a cerebral spinal fluid with opening pressure and cell count and protein levels, and for sure an MRI to look for aseptic meningitis or uh, increased inner cranial pressure. So I think you are all aware that in the past, the three different diseases were described. It was FKS, it was Makaval syndrome, and Nomad and Zika. And after the discovery that they are all caused by the same mutation in the NLRP3 gene, our understanding now is that it is a cryopyrin associated periodic syndrome, and it's a whole spectrum of disease with mild forms, which have typically short attack, most of them cold induced urticaria, fever, eye manifestation, myalgia, arthralgia, so it's more like the flu like symptoms, and increased inflammatory markers. Those with a more severe phenotype, their flares are longer and can be even continuous. And here we often observe the severe fatigue, it could be cochlear edema, which you can see, and oligoarthritis. And in the very severe form, the inflammation is continuous, sometimes with exacerbation. These patients are symptomatic really early in life, and they have, in addition to the other symptoms, organ megaly, uveitis, arthritis, and the chronic aseptic meningitis. Chronic damage is rarely seen in the mild form, but in the more severe form, there is a high risk of developing amyloidosis and the progressive sensory hearing loss, which has a major impact on the quality of life of these patients. In the severe form, if they are untreated, there's a very high risk of amyloidosis, but also for CNS damage, like brain atrophy and cognitive impairment, or the skeletal changes like the epiphyseal bone growth, like limp leg dyscrasia and contractures. The differential includes all the other auto-inflammatory disease, but also the systemic onset JIA. 
Since we learn a lot from our patient, this is another patient I would like to introduce to you. It's a 12-year-old boy who had symptoms since birth. Fever, rash, headache, conjunctivitis, arthralgia, myalgia, arthritis, and always elevated inflammatory markers. He was at least hospitalized for 14 times, and they didn't come up with a diagnosis. The mom gave up her job. They had major issues in their marriage, problems with the siblings, and she was traveling through the whole country to search for competent care. When we saw this boy for the first time, he already had hearing loss, cognitive delay, growth delay, skeletal deformities, and we con could confirm the clinical diagnosis that he had definitely a pathogenetic NLRP3 mutation. So the mom was asking me, what can we do? And the colleagues, how should we treat this patient? In 2015, these recommendations were uh, published and was a European initiative of the SHARE initiative, among other recommendations. And we all agreed that for a CAPS patient, a multidisciplinary team should be uh, there. It should be patient-centered, family-centered, and they all need psychosocial support. We also agreed on the aims on the treatment that the early control of disease activity is important to prevent damage and to enable these patients on daily activities and improve their quality of life. We are lucky that to reach this goal that there are three IL-1 inhibitors available, Anakinra with the very short half-life, Rilonacep with a longer half-life, and Kanokinumab, the human antibody, with a remarkable long half-life of almost 28 days. However, as we just heard yesterday, this is not available in all countries, which is a shame. But it was really cl a really clear recommendation that long-term IL-1 inhibition should be started as early as possible to prevent damage. And as we just heard before, it's then important to monitor disease activity and to see if the disease activity is controlled or if damage <coughs> occurs. So in Germany, we were thinking about how can we implement these recommendations in our daily clinical work. We all agreed on the main target, and we all agreed on the monitoring tools. And then we thought, you know, we would like to see our patient if they have no disease activity, minimal disease activity, and moderate to severe disease activity. And according to the disease activity, some of them probably might just need symptomatic or on-demand treatment for their, severe, for their flares. And those with a more severe phenotype, they need continuous treatment, and some of them really high doses. But it is very important, however you start, you have to monitor again if you are reaching your goal, if you reach the target. And if not, you have to switch from on-demand to continuous, or you have to increase the dose, finally, to see if you then reach the goal. And then you have to continue to monitor for disease activity and also for damage. And you can use the EDI score to collect, really, the points which show you about the damage score in these patients. We identified certain groups who are the we call them difficult to treat. That means they need higher doses of kanakinumab or shorter intervals of anakinra. And uh, what we have identified is that specifically younger patients, children need higher doses of kanakinumab or shorter intervals as well as higher doses of anakinra. The other group which really needs higher doses are those with a severe phenotype. The study showed the same for patients who were treated with kanakinumab or with anakinra. Although in severe CNS inflammation, anakinra might be even sup superior in controlling aseptic meningitis due to the better, better CNS penetrance. The other group which is on high risk are some mutation, and this figure is showing you the hearing loss of different mutations. And as you can see here, for patients with the E311K mutation or those with the T348M mutation, already in childhood they had a severe hearing loss. 
And here is another example of one of the patients with the, one of the high-risk genotypes. And what you can see here is the black line. In 2007, we started, we diagnosed her and started her in treatment, and she had really moderate hearing loss. Unfortunately, she was deaf on the other side. With the start of IL-1 inhibition, her hearing improved, which you can see here with the blue line. But then, unfortunately, she had a, a treatment pause because she wanted to breastfeed and stopped everything. And then you can see what happened. This is the red line. In between three months, her hearing really deteriorated terribly. And when we restarted her with IL-1 blockade again, we could improve it, but it was not like it used to be. So you really have to monitor these high-risk patients very carefully. The other group which you have to, which is one of the challenging groups, are those with the low penetrance variants or those with the unclear significant variants. And we conducted a multi-center study with uh, looking for patients with these variants of, of unknown significance. And we found out that the phenotype of them is a little bit different. They had clear symptoms of auto-inflammatory disease, but they were not the typical CUPS patient. We also found that they had kind of an intermediate biological phenotype, which you can see here on the caspase one activity and the IL-1 better release. It was not as strong as with the clear pathogenetic mutation, but it was in between. It was not like in healthy, in healthy um, uh, human. So what we found out, these patients really responded also to IL-1 inhibition, but only 50% reached complete response, and all of them, or quite all of them, needed high doses of IL-1 inhibition. So, what happened to our boy is the follow-up. Three, year, three days after we started him on IL-1 inhibition, the parents told us it's a different child, and I think you can see this picture. He is definitely different. He had no fever, no headache, no conjunctivitis, arthralgia. Hearing improved. He gained weight and height. He was happier. His school performance was really great. And all the inflammatory markers normalized. So we were really excited. But then the parents went to our social worker and they told us, you know, we still have concerns. After this long journey of finding the diagnosis, it's hard for us to really trust physicians. It's so hard to find a physician who is really going with us through the, this treatment period now. They still have, have uh, concerns about the organ damage they already have with their child and the continuous monitoring they have to do. And their major concern is about the future. What does it mean living with a handicapped child? Does, what about his school performance? Will he be able to find a job or will he even have, will they have own children? So there are a lot of unmet needs which has to be addressed and tomorrow I will talk about this, how we're going to address this in our center. So to summarize, before starting treatment in the CUPS patient, a really a reliable diagnosis has to be established. The target should be control of disease activity, but also to improve health-related quality of life. Depending on the diagnosis and the disease activity, different therapeutic options are available, but it is really important to monitor disease activity and, if necessary, to adjust the treatment. And that's really my... my one thing I would like to say, unmet needs have to be addressed so we can really provide prohensive care. At this point, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank all my colleagues who help us taking care of, of these families. Thank you very much.